Welcome everyone to uh, Transformation Talks. Uh, I'm Tairo Hassan, the director of uh, Brightline at uh, PMI. Uh, we are very happy to have you with us today. And uh, the talk today would be about uh, exploring strategic doing uh, in evidence-based, practice-proven framework for digital transformation and resiliency in organizations. Uh, strategic doing was incubated at Purdue University and leaders are utilizing it across the globe for organizational transformation. I would like to welcome Dr. Scott Hackison in a conversational uh, transformation talk. And uh, Scott is a professor at uh, Purdue University in the Department of Technology and Leadership and Innovation. And uh, he's the founder of Hackison Associates. Uh, as you may see or you may have uh, read, Scott helps leaders design, grow, and strategically transform organizations, communities, and ecosystems to make them more adaptive, innovative, and uh, competitive. He is also co-author of the book, uh, Strategic Doing, 10 Skills for Agile Leadership, which was actually number one seller on Amazon in six categories including business management and project management. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you, glad to be with you. Let us uh, get starting. Uh, the topic today is about uh, how digital transformation can help facilitate organizational resiliency. So uh, let's start with some definition or defining some terms. Uh, Scott, uh, when you use the term digital transformation, how do you define it? Because I know it could mean different things to different people. Sure, sure. Well, let, let's let's start with the notion of of transformation, and then maybe we'll add um, digital to it. Um, transformation is is something we're all familiar with because we're 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 doing it. Uh, none of us are uh, staying the same. Whether we're talking about uh, ourselves as people whether we're talking about our relationships or whether we're talking about the organizations in which we work, they're, they're constantly transforming. And anytime you talk about organizational transformation, um, today it's got to include the digital because we all have been digitally transforming for a number of years. So it's a term that we've recently started to kind of talk about, but we've been doing it well, we've been doing it ever since there's been digital technologies. I, I can distinctly remember sending my first email in 1990, my first job with American Airlines. And it was just inter-office. It was inter-organizational. Uh, inter and I remember thinking that the name was silly. Email? What in the world is email? Instead of sending an office uh, memo, right, we were digitally transforming. And we have been... We have been ever since. So um, let's stick with that notion of, of transformation for a minute. Um, I, we've got a poll, I think, and let's launch that first poll because I have a question for all the participants and I'm curious to hear the answer to. Um, so the question is a personal one. To what extent are you the same person you were seven years ago? All right. Are you largely the same person? Are you somewhat different as a person? Are you significantly different? Are you a completely different person? Let's let's launch that poll and see what the reason is. Thank you. Uh, and then thank you. 86% of people responding here. Uh, and and uh, what the distribution is, uh, if we look sure. at the numbers, uh, completely different or significantly different person. Uh, we have 60, 62% if you add these. And then if you add also somewhat different, meaning that the there is a change, you get to 98%. Uh, if you add also about 2% would say largely the same. Any right. any reaction with that, uh, Scott? Yeah, um, of course, you're going to take that differently. But here, here's the reason I picked seven years. Um, in some fundamental ways, we are a completely different person than we were seven years ago um, because our cells have regenerated. Right, so every seven years, we have a brand new us. Right now, as we age, not every one of those cells seems to uh, regenerate as much as they did when they were younger. But largely, the human body is a brand new human body every seven-ish years. 
So we are transforming as we speak. We're losing, we're losing cells. We're growing new cells. So we are quite familiar with transformation. But in other ways, we're somewhat still the same person. It's the same genetic blueprint. It's the same DNA sequence that makes us who we are. So any of those answers could have been right, depending on how you describe them. Um, but that's a, a good, uh, I think, anchor for helping us understand transformation. And it's the same for organizations. If I'd asked that, are you the same organization? Uh, many of you don't work for the same organization as you did seven years ago. But pick an organization. Is it the same organization as it was seven years ago? Absolutely not. And uh, organizations are transforming all the time. And they're digitally transforming all the time. But not all at once. Just like the human body, these, these transformations can be uh, gradual over time, but after a certain amount of time, it is a completely different organization, whether you're talking about the people running it or the experiences that, uh, that those people have or the digital technologies that you're using, and then multiply that beyond just you. Your suppliers are changing. Your customers are changing. So we're all, we're all organizationally transforming uh, uh, all of the time, right? So when I think about digital transformation, that's what comes to mind. It's not some switch that you turn. Yesterday, we weren't digitally transformed. Today, we are. It's gradual over time. Um, now, the human body transformation that I just mentioned, that's organic transformation. And organizations transform organically as well. It's unplanned. It just, it just happens as time marches on. But what about strategic transformation? I like to use that term. I use it to describe whether it's change management or uh, uh, trying to innovate or uh, launching and, and executing a new strategy. Now that's strategic transformation. So that's a little bit of a different animal. So how do we um, uh, harness our power to transform in a way that ties to our strategic objectives? And yes, Digital is certainly a part of that, uh, but the human side of that is part of that as well. So when I think about digital transformation, those are the kind of things that are going through my head. Thank you so much, uh, Scott. And uh, you know, as you were mentioning uh, the seven-year window, uh, I was thinking, and uh, we were looking at uh, a book that we released last year regarding perpetual transformation. We're noticing that it's not something that is uh, one and go. You know, uh, what we're finding is, of course, you shift, but by the time you realize the, the ecosystem is changing, the environment is changing, the customer demands are changing. So you are really in that perpetual cycle where you shift and you shift and you shift, uh, and, and, and that is the new way of being. Of course, right. Just uh, linking to that then is, we talk about digital transformation. Uh, let us maybe uh, look at closer to home. What about uh, organizational resiliency? Huh. And uh, what, what is a helpful way maybe to think about uh, resiliency? Yeah, so um, resiliency is a, another term that we, we use a lot. And, and what does it mean? Well, it's our ability to withstand uh, interruptions, uncertainty. Uh, when we get knocked down or when we take a punch, do we do we fall down and we're, we're like that boxer out for the 10 count? Uh, or do we keep on our feet or at least if we get knocked down, how do we stand back up? So again, let's let's kind of anchor it to ourselves as human beings. Um, we we talk about, you know, I'm a, a part of my job is as a professor. So we, we talk about student resiliency a lot more than we did a a few years ago, especially post COVID. Um, we talk about mental health a lot more than we used to and have many more supports uh, for our students and for our faculty. So I think we, we've gained a better understanding of what uh, personal resiliency is. And we know that it's a, it's a set of kind of an internal um, characteristics, but it's also external characteristics, mostly associated with the social network that you have around you, the supportive network. So a big component of resiliency is not just your own personal resolve, but the network that you set up around yourself um, to help us be resilient. So um, I think resiliency is, is, is quite relational. 
right? So an organization that is resilient, I think that's a, a relational um, phenomenon as well. Uh, the the networks that we have, we have our formal uh, uh, structure, often quite hierarchical for lots of good reasons, because they're functions that are served well in a hierarchy. But hierarchies, I don't think, give us resilience. In fact, they can work against us. So most organizations have a complementary organizational structure that's quite a bit more horizontal. Um, and it's not an either or. It's not an either an open network or command and control hierarchy. Instead, it is understanding that we have both operations, operational systems, if you will, and recognizing which function is better served with which one. And I think resiliency is served best through these horizontal relationships that we have in our in our organizations. And again, it's not too different from our own lives. If you think about the people that you have around you, whether it's a spouse or a partner or close friends and confidants, that helps us as individuals be resilient. So resilience is, is relational. And the, the currency of relations is conversation, right? Conversation is the, the currency that connects us with other human beings, whether we're talking about in our lives or whether we're talking about with, um, with our, our colleagues and our customers. We better be in dialogue with our customers. We better be in conversation with uh, our coworkers, our, our, our suppliers, right? So those, uh, those connections that we make is what helps us be resilient. So um, I, I'd like to do an, another poll uh, because yes. conversation, uh, uh, the, the smallest unit of change is the conversation. So we, we change, as, yeah, we, re, we change as a result of the conversations that we have, whether it's personally or whether it's in organizations. So um, we often talk about uh, uh, making space for deep focused conversations in our organizations about things that matter. And it's those relationships that get built that create the resiliency. So I'm, I'm curious. So the next poll question, in a typical work week, how much of your time is spent having deep, focused conversation? Quite a lot, some, not much. For some of you might confess, not at all. It's always the small stuff. It's always the details. It's not deep and focused. Um, let's see what this poll says. Hope we get as good a participant yeah, no, no, rate as we did in the last the, one. The participant rate is just amazing. Uh, we are clocking 80% uh, and over. And uh, I'm glad to report that we have uh, uh, about 140 attendees uh, with uh, 400 and more registering. So this is amazing here. And thank you for the reply. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, about 85% response. Uh, yeah, good. Let's stop here. And uh, these are the results. Uh, uh, what we're seeing really uh, in, in terms of uh, quite a lot, only about 13% get into quite a lot, uh, uh, they spend quite a lot of time uh, in deep conversation. And then uh, some about 50%. And then uh, we have another 38% uh, that is either known or not much. Uh, for mm -hmm. none, we are at 3%. What, what, okay. what, does it, what does it tell you? Is there any insight you're pulling from this, uh, Scott? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm encouraged. I've asked this question uh, among other groups of leaders, um, and I've seen examples where there's even less uh, of, a, of, a, of, of a culture of deep focused conversation. Um, so I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged. And what that means to me is that um, those of you who are finding time, uh, you're doing so deliberately. Because if you don't do so deliberately, you won't, you won't find the time. We're all overworked. We're all busy. There's so much taking up our attention and our energies that's not at that deep focus level. Um, and again, uh, relationships take care, right? So, it, you know, we, we, we know from research that deep focus conversation, again, in our personal lives, results in better quality of life, uh, better 
um, uh, satisfaction with your lives. And we also know, interestingly, with, with older people, it, it means better health and longevity. If you're having deep conversations with people who care about you uh, and people who you care about. I mean, if you think about, um, it, you know, if you've had a longer term romantic relationship, uh, it started out with some deep com focused conversations. I guarantee you those long uh, in my day was chats face to face uh, without without texting or perhaps over the phone for hours at a time when you were separated. Right. So that's how we get to know, know others. That's how we have uh, 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 create that relational uh, uh, aspect of that's so important to our personal lives. Same in our organizations. So if we don't make space to have those deep focused conversations, they're not going to uh, occur. Um, I love, uh, I sometimes talk about the, uh, uh, the Roosevelt effect. So Eleanor Roosevelt is a former first lady of the United States uh, uh, and her husband, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president during World War II. And she's known, if you're not from the US, she's known for these wonderful quips. And so the Roosevelt effect uh, comes from this. So she said, let's see, small-minded people uh, talk about people uh, uh, kind of medium minded people talk about events and really deep people talk about ideas, right? So we should be, <laughs> we should be big minded people having deep focused conversation about how our organizations are transforming. Cause remember they are transforming. So if we're not talking about what we want our organizations to 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 look like and be like and how they will serve our customers um, in the future um, then we're we're missing the boat uh, i remember working with one senior leader and he was very it was a change management project and he was uh curmudgeonly is the word that i use just always kind of complaining about everything and why are we doing this and he did not see the need for doing what we were doing. But near the end of the process, I had one more conversation with him. And he said to me this, he said, I guess sometimes things have to change in order for them to stay the same. Oh, wow, this is profound. I, I, I made him repeat it because it, it kind of joggled my brain. So I said, repeat it. He said, sometimes I guess things have to change in order for them to stay the same. And then I realized how profound it was, right? So uh, we have these organizational values. We have what makes us special, right? What hooked us to begin with, to be a part of that organization or to, to build it from scratch. Yet we have to kind of reinterpret that all the time to stay true to it. So even something like values, which sounds like it should just be forged in iron and never change, they have to be reinterpreted, All right? So let me give you an example from, from family life that hopefully everyone can understand. So I have sons who are 18 and 21. When they were little guys, when they were three and six, the best Friday night they can imagine was Friday night movie night with mom and dad. So we'd get pizza or we'd get something, we'd make cookies, we'd settle in to watch a family movie Right? Why? Because we all valued quality family time. Now, my wife and I could have articulated that. My boys couldn't have articulated it, but they valued it. They loved it. You know, it was Wednesday or Thursday. What movie are we going to watch? Can we get pizza on Friday night? You know, so so that so our value was quality family time. But we have had to revisit what that value means at every stage in their development. Right. So imagine if I only interpreted quality family time as Friday night movie night and they're 18 and 21, you better be home every Friday night for a family movie night. That would destroy our family, right? So we have to reinterpret that value of quality family time as we reach different stages in those relationships. So deep focused conversation, even about our values, how we reinterpret those values when we have new digital technologies available to us, when consumer preferences are changing overnight, we better be having deep focused conversations uh, about how we're going to strategically transform. And, 
and I'm taking that one uh, really uh, I'm looking at the statistics and the data that came in that uh, I mean encouraging people to have a very deep uh, focused uh, conversation and then when you link it of course when we have the conversations there are ideas that come up and sometimes you see that uh, the ideas just stay at ideas level there is no action that is taken so the idea just stay there and in some in some contexts, that conversation is in the open, but it could even create mistrust here. I want to maybe uh, move on and uh, looking at uh, the book that you have, yeah. uh, Strategic Doing, uh, 10 Skills for Agile Leadership. Uh, you discuss uh, transformation and resilience see a lot in that book. Uh, can you share with us, uh, because for me, I'm interested in knowing how the discipline of strategic doing came about. Uh, sure, if sure. You can explore more. Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning the book. And by the way, uh, there's there's going to be a special offer, a, a giveaway, if you will, near the end uh, related to the book. So stick around to, to make sure you get the, a chance. So let me back up. Long before there was a book, um, there was a recognition um, that, that transformation, whether you call it strategic planning or change management or innovation, uh, what have you, um, was not working as well as it once seemed to. And I'm sure you've all experienced that. The tools that we seem to rely on, traditional strategic planning models, you know, SWOT, uh, change management disciplines that were very, you know, uh, uh, regimented, served us well for a long time. And I would even say project management served us really, really well for a long time. And then all of a sudden it didn't seem to be working as well as it used to. Um, so I recognized that and began to scratch my head and wonder, oh, all right, well, well, why? You know, why do seemingly equally resourced, uh, uh, equally groups of committed people, um, why do so many seem to fail at their transformation efforts? And some, you know, a minimal amount seem to succeed. So, so I became very interested in that phenomenon and wanted to learn more and along the way met others who were asking similar questions. So we decided to look at honestly thousands of transformation efforts um, to, at both uh, uh, failures. Um, and if you believe the, you know, the McKinsey's of the world, 70% of, of transformation initiatives fail, right? And we wanted to look at successes as well. So this actually evolved into my dissertation research. So I looked at uh, successful transformation efforts and looked at uh, those that were less than successful. And a, a, a pattern began to emerge that was present in nearly all of the successes and absent in nearly all of the uh, failures. And it was, you know, we talked about conversation. It was a pattern of the, the narrative of, the, of transformation, the conversations that they would have relative to, converse, relative to tr change and transformation. And the successful ones seem to follow a specific pattern of uh, exploration that would ask questions like, well, all right, here's our challenge, or here's our opportunity, what could we do, right? Let's open up the aperture to consider all the things we could do. And then a mechanism to say, but, all right, of all those things we could do, what should we do? So begin to, to, to narrow down to, to some strategic choices. And then what, what will we do? What specific actions will we take in short time buckets, right? Over the next 30 days, what will we do? And then we'll come back together and we'll, 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 we'll consider what, what we'll do in the next 30 days, the next 30 days. Now, 30 days wasn't always the pattern, but there were these triple feedback loops, constantly looking at testing assumptions uh, uh, and, 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 and taking a look at the context to see if it had changed. So we recognized that pattern and we found kind of 10 markers on that pattern. And those 10 markers became what we began to refer to as the 10 rules, right? And by rules, we, we did, I, I didn't mean um, like rules of monopoly, but more heuristics, rules of thumb. So I, I, I teach, uh, uh, I end up having a lot of student athletes in my, in my classes. Um, and I remember having a baseball player one time and I said, how do you catch a fly ball? 
right? And he, he couldn't explain it. And it, it, as it turns out, there's a mathematic formula for how you catch a ball. But does he have that mathematic formula in his mind? No. He's following like two or three rules in terms of where you set your eyes, how you move your body in relation to that, right? It's kind of intuitive. So, so there are these heuristics that seemed to be present in this uh, pattern. And that pattern, we began to see if we could articulate, see if we could not just look at it in, in, in retrospect, but could we design strategic um, transformation processes using that same pattern? And that's what evolved into what we now refer to as strategic doing, the strategic doing discipline. So we, we have this 10 set of rules, and then a set of leadership skills. And the subtitle of the book is Agile Leadership. So what are the 10 skill sets that a leader needs in order to lead an organization or a team with, with agility? So, so that's where uh, both the notion of strategic doing and uh, the the kind of what's under the hood sort of came from. And we began practicing it before we called it strategic doing and realized it's doing. We, you know, there's certain things you can only learn by doing, um, whether it's riding a bike or whether it's, you know, figuring out how to uh, fix your car. You, can, you can't just watch YouTube videos or read about it. You have to do it. So transformation is is the same. We 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 learn to transform by 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 doing, but then doing strategically. So we began refer to it as strategic doing and begin um, uh, teaching others those those ten skills and how to apply them. Thank you so much for setting that stage where, uh, on strategic doing. Uh, I have a question that is coming uh, from uh, Vivek Sona. So the, the question is: I witness individuals, teams, members giving up midway just because they lost patience. What's your view on, on it? Uh, so, 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 so basically, we were saying that things are changing, but sometimes it's attention span or the willingness to wait and see other result come to to fruition. Uh, sure. Organization don't have that patience. Right. And and understood, we 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 don't have the the same patience as individuals often for for long time uh, change. It's just part of the human nature for for most of us. So how do we build in? Um, there's been a lot of research done on the power of small wins, right? So how how do we create um, processes in which we can have small wins? So in the strategic doing process, for instance. Um, we talk about Pathfinder projects, right? So a, a Pathfinder project is something with a relatively short time frame. So nine months, or excuse me, nine weeks is a, or, um, a, a typical uh, Pathfinder project, ni 90 days rather, 90 days to 120 days. But even within that um, 90 to 120 days, you have shorter feedback loops. So um, everyone is taking action, uh, and and we have a way of of kind of structuring what those actions are, and they're often um, uh, they're micro commitments because typically we take on this transformation work on top of our work of keeping the lights on in our organization or keeping the existing customers happy or keeping the existing products rolling off the you know the assembly line. So we can't drop everything and commit to having those deep focused conversations that lead to strategic uh, action. So we have to have a, a lightweight structure that doesn't require uh, uh, all of our time and our energy. So we find that if it's action oriented, people, people don't like to wait around. People like to do things and people like to experiment. So if we do, we find out what works, we find out what, what doesn't. So it's very action oriented, but trans, trans but the, True transformation will take a while, right? So, so we we sometimes say you've got to go slow to go fast, and that usually uh, uh, is proven in 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 results of transformative efforts as well. And we know that you know we know that when you when you engage about twenty five percent of the overall population, that's your inflection point. So, you know, when you're trying to change the culture of your organization, or you're trying to to, to, to change the consumer behavior. Once you get to about the 25% mark, 
and it might take you a while to get to, to get to 25%, but that's where you see your first inflection point. So go slow to get to the 25 and then and then you, you begin to to go to go fast. So these short um, think do cycles um, can help address that uh, that impatience for for seeing progress. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, thank, thank you for this answer. Because again, uh, it's it, it is sometimes we say it is a marathon. It is a marathon. It's not just a once and done. And and a commitment need to be there for the long haul. And of course, uh, the need to show quick wins or some wins at least sure. in this cycle of revisiting and knowing how things are progressing and so on. So more like a, a quest or a journey because things are never uh, the same, but there need to be that communication line, making sure that people are aware, people know what is happening and it's not, let's say a silo and so on. Right. I, I just want to move on. Uh, you already talked about the, uh, the concept of pi uh, Pathfinders uh, sure. project. Maybe you can elaborate more, but I want you also to look at the, in the book, there were two two concepts that you at least uh, two concepts that you cover there. one that is called big easy and then there is a the pathfinders that you just mentioned can you tell us more about uh, the big easy pathfinders project sure sure so um the big easy has nothing to do with new orleans unfortunately uh so the, <laughs> new orleans is known as the big easy um, but but let me back up a little bit from the Big Easy so I can put the Big Easy and uh, Pathfinder projects in more context. So when I'm working with a, uh, a an organization and their leadership, I'm often suggesting that you should be playing three hands of blackjack simultaneously, if you will. Um, one of those uh, one of those should be related related to your in, innovating with your products or your services. You know whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you're selling you better be thinking about what you're gonna sell next, All right? So that's one hand of blackjack. Uh, the second is your market. So who are you gonna to sell to? Either who, who are you gonna sell your existing products to that you're not selling to currently, or who might you be selling a new product to? So one hand is is a bet on, on your product innovation. Another is a, is a bet on your um, uh, market innovation. And then the third is on operations or your organizational structure because you better be thinking about changing that as well. So um, each of those, we, we, you can use something like strategic doing to um, make some hypotheses about the three of those, right? We, we talk about starting with a framing question, an appreciative future-oriented question that people can engage with uh, emotionally. Um, and then, uh, then that those questions become a watering hole, if you will, right? That attracts other people like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, I want to be a part of that, right? Um, and as they come together, we surface our, our assets, right? That we have that we think might be valuable. And then we think about how we would link and leverage those assets to create new strategic opportunities. So let's say we are playing those three hands of, of poker. We have three hypotheses, one about our product, one about our market, and one about or organizational structure. Well, as you move through the strategic doing cycle, you go very quickly from just uh, coming up with your hypothesis to testing it. So you, you very well, uh, in, in each of these um, hands of, of blackjack, if you will, you start out with that first question of strategic doing, what could we do? And you may have a whole bunch of things you could do, right, to, to, to realize the future that you envision. But in order to answer the second question of strategic doing, but what should we do, right? Narrow it down to the one or the two. That's where the big easy comes into play. So we have a way of helping evaluate potential strategic options to find which one of them represents a big easy. The big idea that we think could really be transformational, right? Oh my gosh, if we were able to be successful at this, it would change everything in a good way, right? But we also need to find the path of least resistance. That's where the easy comes in. So the big easy is a basic four, two by two matrix, right? We're looking for the big idea that's relatively easy to execute. So um, I've described that and some people said, well, it's low hanging fruit. Well, sort of, but imagine there are three pieces of fruit hanging low. It's the ability to pick the one that's going to be the most delicious, 
right? So, so that's what we mean by the big easy. So your big easy is your idea that is potentially transformational and potentially easy to execute on. Um, that's a complex decision that most people can't make themselves. So that's why we need to have deep focused conversations and capture the strategic intuition of the group about which is the big easy. So we have a way that we coach leaders to uh, bring bring people together uh, to to make those big easy decisions. Then once you've once you've uh, made a big easy, or once you've made a, a, a big easy selection, that becomes your potential strategic opportunity. Then you have to make it real because right now it's just a bumper sticker says, well, we should do this. Well, then the next set of conversations is to convert a strategic opportunity to a strategic outcome that's measurable. So how do we how do we make this measure? How would we recognize success if we saw it? And how would we measure or observe that success, right? Now comes the Pathfinder project, because that's still probably a pretty bold thing that we're trying to do. So our Pathfinder project is our first test of our hypothesis. It's a pilot. It's a phase one. It's a prototype. It's a pop-up. It's one of those action-oriented things we will do, right, to test our hypothesis that this could be big, and we think it's going to be relatively easy. So the, the combination of the big easy, how do we make strategic choices? How do we rule th some things out, rule other things in? And then the Pathfinder project comes to play, and all right, well, but what are we actually going to do? We move from what should we do to what will we do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Here's what I'm going to do, right? To execute that Pathfinder project. It's coming to my mind that we may not know all the answers. So it is, I mean, let's start with uh, uh, a, a step where we are on a quest. Uh, we are looking, uh, sensing, testing, piloting, and uh, finding the path because sometimes uh, I mean, leaders or organizations feel like they, might, they must know all the answers, and uh, <laughs> that's not where, where they find themselves. Right. Let me move on uh, with a question by uh, Michael. Uh, okay. And Michael, yeah, Michael is saying, I found um, Peter Senge, the fifth element, uh, the fifth discipline, extremely informative with regard to dealing with transformation in systems which are difficult to change. He's giving us uh, an example of the Department of Defense. Now, uh, the question is, how would you introduce a transformation strategy within organizations that have rigid systems in place? Before you answer, I want, I want to call upon the, uh, the attendees as well, the participants. This is a question that we may all have a take. I want sure. you uh, to, in the chat, the, to also Ooh. jot your idea regarding how you'll address that question. And then uh, 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 Scott will also give us some hints. Go ahead, sure. Scott. Well, welcome to my world. Right, that's the world that I live in. So I'm at Purdue University. If you don't know anything about Purdue, it's one of the uh, top public engineering schools in the United States. Uh, aeronautical engineering uh, uh, is, is one of our, our, our most successful programs, as is uh, agriculture and biological engineering. But we have all the other flavors of engineering. One distinction about Purdue is uh, more astronauts have walked in space that are Purdue graduates than graduates of any other university. You may have heard of this guy named Neil Armstrong. Not ever sure whatever became of him, but he's a graduate of Purdue. Of course, Armstrong was the first man to walk into space. So I work in a very engineering centric uh, uh, organization and I'm a social scientist, All right? So uh, I work every day with, um, uh, a mindset that is uh, trained to think of constraints and that is trained to think of the world and of organizations as uh, machines, right? Uh, that are predictable. Uh, of course, they, don't, they know that it's not, but the, the mindset is that it is, right? So I've had a lot of strategic doing related projects in very engineering uh, and technology focused organizations. Uh, we've worked with NASA. Uh, we've worked with um, one of the large military contractors in, in just those situations in which change, innovation, and strategic transformation are really, really difficult because, because the DNA of those organizations is to de-risk everything, right? And to focus on 
greater and greater efficiencies, right? We need that, of course we do, right? That's what built the industrialized economy uh, and built wealth in, in, in a way that has never been seen before, right? But, but when, when that mode of working is starting to play itself out and we need to transform digital or otherwise, it makes it really, really hard. And organizations have immune systems, just like our human bodies. And when something comes in that feels like a threat, it fights back. Even if you could go one by one and ask people, yeah, we want to transform. Yeah, we want to transform. There's something about the collective that behaves differently, right? So I found that you have to offer an experiment. I, so I often come into a place like NASA or a place like a uh, big military contractor. First of all, they found their way to me because something that they've been trying isn't working. We're trying to transform, we're trying to innovate, we're trying to change, and by gosh, we just keep spinning our wheels. And very often the narrative is this, we just hired fill in the blank for one of the large consulting firms. They worked with us for a year, they delivered a plan, we paid them six, sometimes seven figures, but we don't, we don't know what to do, right? They, they, they gave us a diagnosis or they gave us some ideas, but we don't know how to execute on them. So what I do is I, I, I come in and I say, no sweat. Let's pick one recommendation from that report. Not the, not the top one, but not the small stuff, somewhere in the middle. And you said, if we made progress on that, we'd all be happy. Right. So I'd say, great, let's experiment with a new way of trying to do that thing. And then you be the judge in 90 to 120 days. You will have evidence to say, are, are we able to get things done in this way? And we haven't been able to get things done in this way. I, I don't know. I think you will. But I don't know. But you will know. Right. And then once you know, then we can decide, all right, well, how do we do more of our work in this way? Or how do we get better at deciding what of our work needs to work in the hierarchy? It's very well served by the hierarchy, but what of our work, and transformation is one of them, is not served well in the hierarchy. We don't, we don't so, so, to, to, so I don't trigger the immune system by saying, break down the hierarchy. No. You need to be ambidextrous. You need to say some of our functions work great in a hierarchy. Some functions just won't work at all. So you have two operating systems, right? You have one built for hierarchies and the tools that go with that. And then you have another operating system with tools that help you do that more horizontal transformational work. So I, I frame it as, a, as an experiment and I frame it as, I'm not asking you to get rid of what you've been doing. I'm asking you to consider another operating system. I think 15 years ago when I switched from a PC to a Mac, I wanted a divided hard drive, a partitioned hard drive. So I could boot up DOS and Windows or I could boot up the Microsoft OS because I knew there were some functions that were better done with one operating system and some that were better with the other. And it took me a long time to wean myself off of PC. So um, uh, present it as two different operating systems, not one trying to destroy the other, but they can operate in parallel and then start with an experiment and gather the data and see for yourself if it works. Wonderful, thank you. I know, I know, but I'll, I'll just maybe add, but that sometimes we need to let the all go for we need to emerge as well. So, so how you you manage that is is the challenge, right? Uh, I yeah, completely aligned because how you get harness the power of people, how you get people together, so that again, like that willingness because it is my baby today. I I'm, I mean I don't want to let it go. And right. you ask me, but how do I make it transition? Yeah, that, that baby sometimes. Uh, would grow, would meet to work sure. on his or her own, and so on. Let, let, so, let's have, a, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so what, what, what we found is that, so, so here's the hierarchy, right? So here's the hierarchy. And we say, all right, well, let's, let's slide this other operating system underneath this hierarchy. And you migrate just a few of your assets to this new way of doing things. And it's, it's you know, you're still on your regular team, but this is pickup ball on the playground, right? We're going to experiment. We're going to find, you know, what we can do. If they see that, that this creates value, 
they find more ways to dismantle parts of the hierarchy and migrate it to this new way of thinking, right? And this new way of, of doing. And the old starts to, to, to melt away and the new emerges. But here's, here's the crux of the matter. The new will become hierarchical after a while, right? Because you get set in your ways. So it is a constant, you know, we, it, every organization started out as an open network. Anything goes, we'll take on risk. It may have been 150 years ago for some of them, but that's how they all start out. And it's these cycles of the wild, wild west. And then, you know, the, 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 the rigid rules that help us extend that growth and squeeze out uh, as much value as we can. It's the natural progression of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm loving the conversation. I know time is also running. So let's let oh, yeah, maybe yeah. Take, take, take one uh, one question here, but I'll combine two questions here. I know, of course, there are many people here on the line and there are questions uh, trickling in. If someone wants to learn about strategic doing for digital uh, transformation and organizational uh, resiliency, uh, where should they start? But as you're answering this question, I want to add a second part of a question by Ashish, um, where you say, how you are seeing organization experiment transitioning between risk orientation and opportunity scanning. So you mentioned it uh, where the old, the new actually took over the old and later on that new also becomes old. Yeah. And, <laughs> so, so if it is two questions in one, uh, that will be the, the last question that we will take for today. Go ahead. Yeah, so let's start with that risk question. Um, so, you know, we, we each of us is, uh, each of us is uh, uh, unique in our own acceptance of risk and what kind of risk, right? Some of us will take financial risk, but we're certainly not going to take risk with our, with our family or what have you. Um, if you work for a big organization, you're probably the kind of person that wasn't ready to take the risk to be a, you know, an entrepreneur, right? You wanted the safety of an organization. So it's not, you know, it's not uh, it's not that risk is bad. You know, risk averse is bad, and and taking on risk is good. It is um, it is a, a yin to a yang, right? So another area of work that I focus on is uh, cognitive diversity in in leadership teams and in groups that we pull together. So we need we need we need both. We need risk takers, and and I, and I think of them as we need explorers, and we need um, optimizers. So optimizers who dare do everything they can to de-risk something and explorers that are probably too risky, right? They get bored fast. They move on and, and ready to, to face danger, right? The, 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 the truth and the potential for growth is, is having both of those qualities, not in conflict with one another, but in uh, kind of congruence with one another, right? Um, to moderate one another, it, you, you know, one's, one's, one's pulling forward and the other's pulling back. And, and, and moderating that behavior. Yet you need a disciplined way to ha have those conversations, to surface those cognitive diversities and take full advantage of them. So I, I have a set of tools that I use to, to help um, evaluate and visualize cognitive diversity in teams and organizations. But, but having a cognitively diverse team or group is only good if you have a way to... Um, to take full advantage of it. And that's where something like strategic doing comes in. So starting with a cognitively diverse group, giving them the tools to play to their strengths, recognizing that the path forward is probably somewhere somewhere kind of in between. Um, so, so the second part of that question or the first part of the question, I answered the second part first. Um, the second part of that question was how can people learn more about strategic doing? Uh, well, I, I didn't. I didn't join the the webinar in the attempt to sell books, but that's a, a low a low stakes way to do it. Um, so the strategic doing book is affordable. It's not priced as a textbook. It's priced like a regular book. It's uh, freely available on Amazon. Um, but I'm gonna uh, put a, a a code up here in a minute, and and I'm also able to do a, a, a giveaway. So I've arranged to to be able to give away uh, ten copies of the book. So you can enter. Uh, to, to have a copy of the book, but if you don't want to do that, if you're not selected, you can certainly pick it up. So that's a that's a way to 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 learn more. That's your initial uh, dive. Um, but strategic doing is also a discipline that we teach. Um, so I, I teach it here at Purdue University in, in in the graduate school as well as undergrad. But you don't have to enroll at Purdue um, long before it was actually a, a college course, a university course. It was a professional development training. 
Um, so we, we do strategic doing practitioner trainings uh, several times each year. Um, and you can find more about that at uh, have that link as well. So those are that's a much deeper dive, of course, than a book. Uh, but a book is a great place to start. Uh, you can even Google. You Google strategic doing. You'll you'll find a lot out there. Uh, so I urge you to just uh, just start exploring and learning. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate. It. And of course, I uh, uh, someone is saying the link is not visible. So I think uh, Rohit will share the link uh, in the chat so that uh, everybody have access to it. Uh, for people interested in the uh, complimentary copy that uh, Scott has kindly agreed to provide us. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Scott. Uh, I mean, this has been insightful. Uh, I mean, uh, really great conversation here. Uh, whenever I talk about uh, expert and uh, thought leaders in transformation strategy, my dream is always to see that 70% number coming down because you right. hear it uh, spell every time 70% of organization failing and so on. Uh, it, it, is, it is a hope that I will get more and more organizations that are successful and uh, that we could actually build a resilient organization. So thank you for, for the time. I know we are at uh, the time here. I'll ask uh, for us to get the next slide. And I want to share uh, also some good news, uh, some good news uh, regarding a new book also that is coming up uh, soon. Uh, it is about uh, building resilient organizations. Uh, as uh, many of you may know, uh, one of uh, Brightline's pillar is about thought leadership. So every year we work on uh, bringing to life uh, a, comp a compendium of best practices when it comes to transformation strategy in organization. And the next one is building resilient organizations. I often say this is not a book that you read from cover to cover. It is mainly a book where when you open the, uh, the let's say, table of content, you go through it, you see uh, uh, articles or topics that are of interest to you, and then you go on and uh, you you read it and then you basically find ways also of applying it. It's been uh, the result of uh, a great collaboration with Pinker Swifty. And uh, I mean, PMI be always uh, at, at the forefront here. So uh, Brightland being an initiative of PMI. Uh, so uh, really thank you everyone. We hope again that uh, today has been an informative session and uh, we look forward to have you when we actually have a session on uh, on uh, on the uh, release of a book or a station that will talk about uh, uh, some of the elements that are covered in that book. Until then, uh, strategic doing is the way. I mean, uh, not mm -hmm. just thinking, it is actually doing, and that is what is giving us the result. Thank you, everyone, and have a good one.